we will be right back. You are the Live. All right. Sure. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, I was just, we, this is the second time we have had the pleasure of talking to Kyle. Thank you so much for joining again. So, yeah, thanks for having me. so Kyle, the first time we were just talking about Kamimomi, your permaculture center that you started. Um, we didn't have a chance to even touch on your deep knowledge of plastering. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. Um, I was Great. telling you before we started that I did a little bit of plastering when we remodeled our house. And then doing research for this talk, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much more that I had no idea. So mm. I, I'm hoping we can learn lots of things from you today. Sounds good. <laughs> So can you tell us a bit about how you got started with your yeah. interest in insulation and plastering? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, in my 20s, actually, I worked on a lot of different farms in the United States, in Australia, um, in Japan. And I knew that if I wanted to kind of manifest the vision that I had for a, for a home and a homestead, I needed more building skills. So I thought um, I wanted to work for a carpenter. Um, and just by chance, I happened to participate in a straw bale workshop. And that was in the United States, in Pennsylvania. Um, are you familiar with straw bale walls? No, but I've got a few photos from your lecture. So go ahead and explain okay. it. Sure. Um, a straw bale building originated in the, the state of Nebraska in the United States. It uh, started a little more than 100 years ago and uh, basically involves stacking up blocks of straw to create super insulated walls. Uh, in, in Japan, generally straw bale buildings are built in combination with a timber frame and the, the straw bale is just used as, a, as an insulation in that case. And these straw bale walls are oftentimes finished with earth and lime plasters. So when I was living in the United States, I, I started to work with earth and lime. Um, with a, a straw bale company that uh, uh, first I interned with, and then I began working with. I, I heard uh, you. It, I heard you say when you were introducing about the straw bale that a yeah. lot of people, um, or that you were surprised that there wasn't more straw bale in Japan, and that you kind of considered Japan about ten or twenty years behind other countries in terms of energy efficiency, like insulation, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I don't know if I was surprised that there isn't more straw bale. Um, I was surprised that there isn't more energy efficiency in building. And of course, in, in building, um, you know, air quality, building materials, um, the kind of the ecological sustainability of the of the building itself, these all these are important factors, including the the internal environment of the home, right, how comfortable it is. Um, so I was surprised at how cold uh, both traditional and contemporary Japanese homes are. I think you had a comparison between Alabama and Tokyo. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's regarding a straw bale building. Yeah. But for for people who don't live in Japan, uh, to, to kind of to give you an idea of what winters are like here, it's kind of like camping. It's basically camping with the roof and walls around you. But when you wake up in the morning, you know exactly what temperature it is outside because it's the same temperature inside. Uh, that's what that's what winters are like in Japan. Uh, and then um, before we get to the, the Alabama and Tokyo comparison that you, you mentioned, that that's regarding a straw bale building, just to kind of explain the um, how I got into plastering, going back to the, that original question. Um, I had been to Japan before I started working for the straw bale company in the United States, and I had wanted to go back to Japan. And I applied for a, a Mambusho scholarship through the Ministry of Education in Japan. 
And part of that application process is finding a professor willing to supervise your, your research in Japan. And um, I contacted Ito Nagasensei, and at the time, he was the only uh, professor in Japan researching straw bale building. So I, I did my, my PhD with Ito Nagasensei in, in just researching straw bale building and building practices to protect straw bale walls from moisture damage. Uh, and through that PhD work, I basically planted temperature and humidity sensors in walls all over Japan um, and got to work with lots of different architects and lots of different plasters because these straw bale walls were um, generally finished with earth or lime plasters. And I quickly realized um, that compared to Japan, what we were doing in the United States was almost like children's um, plastering. Uh, so I became really enamored with Japanese plastering and took it to a pretty far degree and thought, man, I, I really want to do something with this and um, decided to go to a, a plastering school in Kyoto. Um, and uh, that was a great experience. And after that, um, I, I worked in Hiroshima for a while in Chiba Prefecture and now in Okayama. Yeah, that's great. Um, a lot of the things that you uh, talk about as to why plastering started in Japan or why plastering took such a root in the culture. And you, you talk about fear and fire and yeah. awe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's kind of, kind of my own thesis, and maybe maybe someday I'll write a paper or a book. Who knows? But I think um, there are three reasons for the high development of earth and lime plastering in Japan, and those three reasons are uh, tea, fire, and war. Um, and do you want me to talk about each of those a little bit? Sure. Okay. Well, re regarding tea, um, tea seeds were first brought from China to Japan. I think in the 12th century, and then in the in the 16th century, Senrikyu, uh, this this Buddhist monk, formalized the tea ceremony. And at that time in Japan, um, the the homes and the buildings of aristocrats, um, temples and shrines, those walls were the core were was bamboo and earth, but they were finished with a white finish, uh, a white lime plaster or white washi paper. Uh, and earthen plaster without any finish on it was kind of full, res was reserved for the, you know, the farmers, the peasants, uh, just the, the normal commoners. And Senori Kyu, this Buddhist monk that formalized the tea ceremony, he finished the walls of his tea house with earth. And he was drinking tea with kind of the most powerful people in Japan. That was quite revolutionary. Um, he was kind of a, a revolutionary. And uh, from there, the tea, the tea ceremony spread in Japan, and the building of tea houses also spread. And um, every, the, who, you know, if you ask yourself who was building the tea houses, you know, people with, with power and money were building the tea houses. And these people, they all wanted the, the next best tea house, right? So they would, they would provide the craftsmen the time and the the finances they needed to to make something wonderful something beautiful and in that environment the the tradition of craftsmanship um evolves improves um in kind of stark contrast to the to the conditions that we're in now where everything is time and money and craftsmen are, are constantly pushed towards finding the cheapest option and the, the quickest, the quickest option. Um, the the next factor that I think brought um, earth plastering to such a high level in Japan is fire. If you look at traditional Japanese homes, timber frames, paper shoji doors, thatched roofs, all things that are super flammable, um, and house fires were a real fear in traditional Japan. So much of a of an issue that um, families farmsteads would build an earthen storehouse to store their most precious valuables and their food stocks like rice and miso and vegetables 
um, from fire to protect them from fire. Another aspect of these of these really thick earthen walled storehouses is that they have a very moderate temperature and humidity. Uh, and in case it's not obvious, the thick earthen walls make the buildings fireproof, right? That's what's providing the the fire resistance. Um, so there's a tradition of really thick earth building. And then these really thick and earthen walls are oftentimes finished with a thin lime veneer. Um, and that thin lime veneer protects the earth from water erosion. Um, you know, earth is a wonderful building material. It's 100% recyclable. You can use it over and over and over again. Um, but it's one, <clears throat> it's one disadvantage or it's one vulnerability is water and rain. So um, oftentimes in Japan, these, these lime veneers were used to protect the earthen walls from, from rain. And that's uh, a, a big reason why lime plastering developed, a, I think, a high level in Japan. On top of that, these earthen storehouses were oftentimes a place for, for families and uh, businesses to show their wealth, uh, more, more so than the home. So oftentimes they would have very elaborate um, plastered exteriors. Uh, and that's you know another another factor that led into the development of Japanese plastering. Uh, and the third, I think, major factor is war. Um, and if you think of castles in Japan, they're basically uh, huge kura, so very large timber frames, um, very th thick bamboo and earthen walls, and. Uh, and unlike the kura, these walls are very big, and they require the lime plaster to be plastered over a very large area. Now, traditionally in Japan, lime plaster was applied very thinly. Um, in, in contrast, in, in Europe, in North America, there's a tradition of, of really thick lime plasters, sand lime plasters, sometimes applied in three coats, very thickly. Japan traditionally has a uh, tr has a tradition of very thin lime plaster over earth. So why why was Japan so uh, economical with the use of lime? Any any idea? No local resource. Well, li lime is actually uh, oftentimes locally and plentifully available in Japan. There, there's lots of limestone in Japan. However, when when you um, make Japanese lime plaster shikui from limestone. Part of that process is burning the lime. The uh, the carbon is driven off from the from the limestone from the original limestone, and as the plaster cures on the wall, that carbon is reabsorbed into it, returning the the lime plaster back into the original limestone. Um, so when when you burn off the carbon off of the limestone, you need energy, right? And Today, um, coal is used, cokes. Cokes is used to burn limestone, but traditionally it was charcoal. Um, and if to make charcoal, you need to cut down trees. And you cut down too many trees and you know your ecosystem collapses. So there's a, there was kind of a real sustainable use of lime plastering in Japan, um, used as a really thin veneer over earthen walls. That's really interesting. Um, I, I know that uh, we were surprised when we moved in, and I know a lot of people who remodel old houses are often surprised as well that our walls are full of, of earth <laughs> and, <laughs> and bamboo, you yeah, know? So, yeah. so when we remodeled the old house, we, we love living in an old house, but <laughs> I had no idea that the, like the electrician said, I can't put wires in the wall because you have bamboo and earth in your wall. So either we're going to put it on top or behind, but we can't put it in, you know, like a Western, yeah. a Western yep. house might have. And yep. it was just a big surprise. So yep. I, I think older houses, most, most are made in this way, which you're trying to kind of bring back or keep alive the yeah, spirit I of, think, right? I think every home in Japan prior to World War II was like that, generally a bamboo lattice with uh, an earthen plastered wall. Yeah. 
really interesting. Um, I, I was also fascinated by the tools. You talk mm -hmm. a lot about uh, the Japanese tools of plastering and how uh, they were connected to not being allowed to make swords. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, during the Edo period, uh, there were two general classes of, of blacksmiths, blacksmiths that would make swords and blacksmiths that would make other tools, farm implements. And when Japan moved from the Edo period, the period of seclusion into the, the Meiji period, uh, there was a law passed that these blacksmiths couldn't make swords anymore. I think the, well, the, the entire samurai class was dissolved, as I understand it. And so you had all these very skilled sword-making blacksmiths out of work. Uh, so they began making carpentry and plastering tools. And uh, I don't know if, if John talked about it earlier today when you spoke with him, but um, the same skills that are used in laminating different metals together uh, that the, the sword makers used are, are now used for making Japanese um, blades, chisel and, and plain blades. And the, the, school, the, the skills of, of retempering steels, not retempering, of, of tempering steels um, to add different qualities to them, that, that's incorporated into, into uh, Japanese trowels. So there's uh, a number of different type of, of temperaments, hanyaki, aburayaki, honyaki. Uh, there's different types of metals. Also, jigane iron is used for application trowels. As far as I know, Japan probably has the, the greatest variety of, of trowels of any plastering culture in the world. That's so interesting. And you introduced an uh, artisan in Kagawa, who you said makes a lot of your trowels that you use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, a blacksmith in Kagawa Prefecture in Takamatsu named Yamanishi-san. Um, and uh, it's really the, the state of the state of trowel making in Japan. You, I probably haven't talked to you about this, but it's really in a dire condition. Um, the, the craftsmen who were making these tools are retiring. Um, there isn't the younger generation taking on the tradition. Um, what used to take a month to be made, you might have to wait a year now to get. Uh, and there's, there's fewer and fewer craftsmen who are making the really high-end, high-quality items. Yeah, so I, I think John touched on this as well this morning. Um, that because you're using traditional building techniques like he is, you're supporting these artisans and the tool makers that support what you're doing. And the same thing for you when you're using traditional plastering techniques in Japan. You need these tools. You need definitely. to support these artisans. It's all connected, right? Yep, yep, definitely. And there, there used to be, uh, it was canceled this year because of Corona. Virus, but there there used to be a, an annual gathering of blacksmith and and plasters in Japan. Wow! So I'm also showing another picture of Yamasugi, the only mm -hmm. nationally recognized artisan trowel maker in Japan. You say? Yeah, yeah. Yamasugi is the is the yago is the uh, the the trade name. Uh, his name is Sugita-san. He was the only nationally recognized tra traditional. Uh, trowel maker in Japan. He actually had a stroke um, and his son has taken over the business. His son's a, also an excellent blacksmith. So also making trowels. That's wonderful. And I heard an interesting conversation in the lecture that you did in the States or Canada. I can't remember. Uh -huh. um, and you were, they were asking why some of the trowel handles don't have names. And, and you said a lot of the, the plasterers will want to write their own name quickly and uh, like brand it themselves or oh, something. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, oftentimes um, when you go to a, a work site, if there are a number of different plasterers on site, um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if your tools weren't branded, it could be difficult to distinguish them from other people's tools. Uh, so oftentimes, in order to, you know, eliminate any confusion and also to, you know, protect your tools from disappearing, 
um, Craftsman will brand the, the handle of the tools. Yeah, that was really interesting. And then oil it. I, yes. I, I bought, of course, some trowels. I had no idea that there were so many different kinds. Um, when I was just researching on my own, I wish I had come across your website because your website is a wealth of information. You also oh, have wow. you also have a YouTube channel where you're introducing how to mix um, different plastering and and do different techniques. I love it. I love all the information you have. But yeah, you true. you also do workshops, right? I mean, it's kind of difficult just to learn by yourself. So the kind of workshops you do um, and show people and watch people because it's a it's kind of a physical technique you mm -hmm. find that the workshops are the best way for people to learn oh definitely yeah if somebody wants to to learn more about plastering the the traditional gen generally in in japan uh there's a very high level of specialization so in japan the people plastering are generally just plastering um there isn't tradition there isn't a traditional there isn't a tradition of the builder in japan you know somebody who does carpentry, does masonry, does a number of these things. You, in Japan, oftentimes you would specialize in just one area. Um, so it's not a, most of the people who are plastering in Japan are doing it professionally because that's what they, they do. There is a growing environment, a growing uh, community of people who want to um, create their own uh, lifestyle, people who want to, you know, build their own homes, people who want to uh, take a more active role in providing for their basic needs. And those are the people who are oftentimes interested in, in plastering workshops. There's also a number of professional builders in the United States who are interested in, in incorporating Japanese plastering into their work. Um, we hosted a, a plastering workshop last year in November, and we're hosting another plastering workshop this year in November, November 3rd to the 9th. In, uh, in Okayama, at in your Okayama, facility. Yeah, at Permaculture Center, Kamibumi. Mm -hmm. um, and can, can I tell you just a brief introduction? Of course, to of that, course, that please. Yeah. So um, it's a, it's a seven-day workshop, um, and I, th I think it's a, a, a very valuable uh, seven days. Uh, the first day is wall systems and substrates for plaster. The second day is base coat plasters. Uh, the third day is, is detailing and um, repairing plasters. The fourth day is uh, the, the go-around coat in Japan, uh, something that helps prevent a gap from opening up between the earthen plaster and the, and the timber frame. The fifth day is brown coats. And the sixth and seventh day are finished coats. So I think if uh, if somebody's interested in learning more about Japanese plastering, it's a it's a great opportunity and something that many people who are renovating uh, kominka, um, old Japanese farmhouses or folk houses in Japan, these are really valuable skills that they can use in in their you know renovations. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a comment from Wendy. Wendy is renovating an old house right now. Um, she says, plaster in Japan, utterly fascinating. Thank you. I wonder if you know of anyone building kura for uh, storage today. I have never seen it. Also, it would be great to hear more about your Kyoto plastering school. Um, she's in Kyoto and Nagano area. Sure. She okay. goes back and forth. Um, I think I heard one time that there's probably one new kura a year built in Japan, but I think it's quite rare. Um, I, I heard you say in your lecture that uh, one of the one of the Kuda designers or plasterers or builders um, had only done four in his lifetime. Yeah, yeah. One of uh, <laughs> it was a a group of plasters in in northern Japan. It takes um, that, that it takes a while. Like it, well, it's a huge project, right? Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, during that time, they're also they're also plastering homes and other things too. But that that team of plasters had had built four kura during their career. Wow. Was it, it's, I bet to them it seems like a lot, um, but yeah. that it's just such a huge job. I was, yeah. I was really interested in your temple renovation. 
that you had um, the community, you had it like workshop style and you had a lot of people in the community doing it with their hands. This is something that I love and really embraced about plastering is how it's, you're, it's all the materials I used and I, I see you using is all natural and it actually improves the air quality and it soaks in toxins mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't smell. So you see kids and everybody using their hands to mix it or put it on. Um, and it's, it's unlike paint, it won't harm anybody. I, I really love yeah. that about the natural plastering. Yeah, I've done a, a couple of workshops uh, at temples. Actually, uh, um, the, the, the photo I think that you might show is of Zendyoji Temple in Totsuka. That's Yokohama, right, Totsuka. yeah. Uh, those straw bale walls and the, the base coat earth plasters were applied in a workshop format um, with probably maybe up to 100 people, I think, might have participated in those workshops. Uh, and then another workshop that we did at a uh, temple was in Tokushima, where, uh, and that was the one that you're referring to where we used our hands. Mm -hmm. um, that temple in Tokushima, the, um, the Jushoku, the monk there, something that was important to him was recreating community. Mm -hmm. the, the temple used to be kind of the center for community. Uh, in Japan, and, and now it's kind of lost that that place or that role. And he was really interested in developing more of a community at his temple. So he wanted to do uh, the plastering as a workshop in a workshop type format. Um, and if that's the case, then I, I suggested that why don't we do the plastering actually with our hands? Um, because when you start to use tools, you develop that hierarchy of people who have the tools and people who don't have the tools and people who have more experience and people who have less experience. Um, so in, in this case, uh, we did the entire thing um, by plastering by hand. And we, ca we called it an, uh, you know, an African finish because I was kind of inspired by these images of communities in Africa where the entire community comes together to, to replaster the mosque or to, you know, to plaster the homes. So we, we, we plastered the entire uh, building with our hands. And then as a, as a decoration on the temple, the the motif, the pattern on the on the walls were done with natural colored clays, um, kind of in a, a biwa fruit leaf pattern. Uh, and the reason for that was because that temple uses the biwa, this medicinal plant uh, and fruit as a, as a treatment there. Wow, wonderful. Uh, we've had some con uh, comments from Lockdown Tours. This is fascinating. I'm so lucky to catch this live. So interesting, uh, amazing photos, amazing look at the finish. So I'm just showing photos from your website and from your lecture that you did about the uh, projects that you've done. Cool. I, I was also really interested and kind of ashamed that the remodel company that we used talked me into using styrofoam under our tatami. And I was looking at all your explanations about the natural materials of tatami, how tatami's uh, fibers can be reused in walls as, mm -hmm. as instead of the, the plasterboard. And, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, such innovation and so sustainable. And I hate that there's styrofoam under my tatami now. <laughs> yeah, I it's... wish I had known about you earlier. <laughs> no, and that's, uh, that's another field that's, you know, um, that's becoming less and less common, right? Is our tatami producers or tatami makers. Yeah. Um, Lockdown Tourist says, yes, I'm dead keen to hear about tatami. Great question. So can you walk us through some of the tatami reuse and tatami insulation? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, as you mentioned, traditionally in Japan, uh, old tatami were um, ripped up, shredded, and mixed with earth uh, for, for base coat plasters. And sometimes they're, they're shredded up even finer and used in brown coat plasters. So there's kind of like this cascade of uses, right? Uh, the first use for for straw from the field is used in tatami or, you know, and then after the tatami have served their purpose in the house, then those straws are, are um, shredded for plasters. 
Um, and then they serve their life in the wall. And then maybe that wall is recycled too over time. Yeah. Um, but uh, as you mentioned it, I don't know when this happened, but at some point um, they stopped well, they haven't stopped making tatami. They still make the traditional tatami with just straw cores. But they started to make tatami with styrofoam cores um, or kind of like fiberboard cores, styrofoam and fiberboard sometimes. Um, and unfortunately, these, these tatami mats, unlike previously, can't be shredded up and mixed with earth plasters, right? Um, they actually they, they become landfill when they're at the, the end of their, their life. Um, so I was thinking, what is is there another use that we that we can find for these tatami rather than just becoming industrial waste? And uh, I I was inspired by other people who who done it before me to use tatami as an insulation in the walls. Um, so we've I've used tatami successfully in, in a, as an insulation in, in a number of different walls, but it's it's not my favorite building style. Yeah. But it's, I guess it's a good way to keep the tummy out of landfills. Yeah, for sure. So would you, you wouldn't use, reuse the styrofoam to tummy though, would you? Just the yes. natural. Oh, you yeah, would? No, no that, that's, that's the one that we're, we're using. Okay. To, to, to kind of give it another, uh, an, another step in, in its life, you know, before it goes to the grave. Yeah, of course. To extend the life of any product. Um, make use of it longer is definitely one of the sustainable tactics, right? Yeah. For sure. Uh, styrofoam used because it's cheaper, Lockdown Tour says. Yeah, why styrofoam? It, it, it must be cheaper, right? Or just readily available? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, it's definitely cheaper because if you think of all of the manual work involved in making real tatami mats with straw, um, it's probably cheaper. Um, and it also provides better insulation. Yeah. Um, and then I think we were talked to into it because they they said a lot of bugs come up through the tatami. And if you have styrofoam, you're going to have less bugs because they don't go through the straw like the dani. Everybody's mm -hmm. crazy worried about the dani in your tatami. Um, yeah. yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sad. I wish we had chosen natural materials. <laughs> um, well, let's... The tummy don't last forever, so no. there's still a chance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then when we, we had our tatami was worn because we have cats um, mm -hmm. who like to scratch it. Um, our tatami was worn and the tatami repair person just came and just covered it, recovered it. Yep. And, and yep. I was like, wow, it's actually quite simple. It's not yeah. like he has to do the whole thing. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's let's talk about some of the techniques. I love seeing all the bamboo lattice that you put mm -hmm. under before you start plastering. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah. the The traditional Japanese wall system is a, a bamboo lattice with a earthen plaster on that. Um, and in among bamboo lattices, there's generally two different styles. There's a, a split bamboo lattice. That's generally used to make, uh, in Japan, they would call them shinkabe, which is a, an exposed timber frame. I think in English, sometimes it's called a half timber, where you have a combination of earth and timber. Um, or uh, to make okabe, which are walls that you don't see the timber frame. The timber frame is completely concealed by the earthen walls. Um, in that case, oftentimes round bamboo is used. Um, and then the, the, the half timber walls, you generally build a, a thin earthen plastered wall and in the, the concealed timber framed walls, it generally you build a very thick earthen plastered wall. Yeah, that to me, I like the exposed timber look, mm -hmm. um, but the concealed timber you do also see in Japan. And the amount of earth or plaster that has to go in, because yeah. there the the bamboo frame, the lattice, actually has a lot of hole in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it actually requires quite a lot of earth to fill it yeah. up, right? Yeah, yeah. During 
during the uh, kind of uh, economic development in Japan, um, when they were still building homes with earth and plastered walls, there was a, an increase of companies that produced plasters, earth and plasters for, for these homes. Uh, in Japanese, we call them dorokonya, companies that make earth, earth plaster for these. And they use very large machinery um, and do it very economically. Uh, there's, a, there's a real economy of scale in making earth and plasters like that using big machinery because it's, it's heavy material. And a lot of it is used. But if you think about pre-industrial Japan, where all of the earthen plasters were produced manually, mixing all the straw in their earth manually, um, and if you think about how thick those earthen walls are for kura and castles, that's a lot of, a lot of labor involved in making those walls. Yeah, for sure. And so building the bamboo walls, um, and then you've got a picture of the initial application. So one guy is uh, shoveling the heavy fill plaster, I guess, and yeah. giving it to the plasterer, and he puts it on the wall. And then you're showing the inside and the outside, so you can see how thick it's needed to fill that. It's just, it's so interesting. Really, quite the yeah. process. Yeah, that's that's generally the youngest guy on the work site, feeding everybody else. <laughs> he he looks like he's maybe about sixty, sixty okay. or so. Yeah. Well, yeah that... <laughs> Is he the youngest? He might be. He, he could he could be in that in that company. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then um, okay, so you've got the bamboo lattice. You've got the first layer of plaster. What what is that first layer usually made of? Um, the the first coat in Japanese we call it arakabe consists of uh, a clay earth and straw fibers, um, kind of by volume a one to one. Um, and you would plaster one side of the of the bamboo lattice, and then you would plaster the the back side of that. Um, and every every plaster has you know their their preferred way of doing it. I, I like to do it the same day, if possible. Do one side one you know in the morning and the other side in the afternoon, um, or or even at the same time. Wow, it's it's big job. How many people would be needed to to do that? Um, <laughs> there, there's lots of plasters that work on their own. Wow. Yeah. So it just Kate, it's like it's like John mentioned this morning, um, like when we were remodeling our house and they said, you're really lucky your house is 50 years old, not 30 years old, because mm -hmm. it's built in a proper traditional way. And it's built even though the modern idea is to replace homes, your house is built to last. And um, what, what was I going to say? Sorry. So as it, the way it's built is is using proper techniques, and you can repair it easier as well. Yeah. Yep. If if everything was prefab, it'd be a lot harder to repair. Yep. As well, and of course, plastering is a big big part of that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, there's also a big difference in um, the waste that's produced during renovation. Right. You know, the the homes that were built 30 years ago are all plywood, drywall. Um, wallpaper. So when you renovate those homes, you basically get a dumpster of, of landfill. Whereas uh, the home that you live in, that's 50 years old, that has this bamboo lattice and earthen plastered wall, when you renovate that, you can actually reuse the earth. Uh, the timber can, can be used for fuel. Uh, the, the straw can, can return to the earth. You can compost it in your garden. That's wonderful, isn't it? And I actually see that with some of the old houses in my neighborhood. Um, there was an old house that wasn't lived in for over 10 years, and the bamboo took over. It just became like a bamboo grove right through the house. And I kind of like that idea. Like, if we ever left, we just let the bamboo take over. <laughs> I'm sure the neighbors wouldn't be happy, but... <laughs> A uh, woven squash says, could you ask about the merits of potential pro or p potential problems of changing the floor of rooms in old houses from tatami to timber floorboards when renovating an old house? So not, not really connected to plastering, but 
Do you have any opinion about that? Uh, yeah, John would probably be more knowledgeable than I am. Um, but when taking out tatami, um, you're going to have, uh, you know, it depends on the thickness of the tatami, but could be up to six centimeters that that tatami would, would, would fill. Um, so unless you fill that six centimeter gap, um, you're going to have a level difference between your shiki, the thing that runs under your sliding doors and your wood floor. Oftentimes in Japan, what people do is they, they put down uh, um, nailers and insulation between the nailers and then floorboards where the floor finished height is the, the same height as your, your threshold under your doors. Now, I was really uh, impressed about the tataki, the earthen mm -hmm. floor. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I started wondering if I've actually been into houses that have the tataki, and I just assume it's concrete or stone. Like, it looks, yep. it takes, it's a big process, but it, it yep. looks solid, like stone. It's an amazing yep. thing. Can you yeah, describe you that? Yeah, if you've ever been into any old farmhouses or old barns in Japan, you've probably walked on a tataki floor and didn't even know it. Um, and the old ones can can uh, can be very rough but very hard. Um, and the tataki floors that we generally do in in homes today generally tend to be quite quite smooth and and level. Uh, tataki, the 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 sound of it sounds like the Japanese verb to pound, to taku. Uh, and if you look at the Chinese characters, it's um, three harmony earth. And that's reflected in, it's a, tataki is generally made from three ingredients, um, earth, lime, and bitterin, which is a byproduct of salt production. When salt is boiled, first the sodium crystals precipitate out, and then you get this, uh, I think it's like, um, potassium and magnesium and other other minerals that are left um they're left in a liquid solution and that liquid solution is is bitter and the those three materials uh, are mixed to produce the, to the the mix for a tataki earthen floor it's so interesting and it, the process that you showed in your lecture and i think on your website as well it is like plastering you do have like a earth and fibers and then smoothing it out, and it it is just like wall plastering. I was really well, interested. Not, not entirely, not no. entirely like wall plastering. It, it is. We do pound <laughs> yeah, in yeah. Japan. It is pounded, but um, but yeah, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, lockdown tourist says, "Amazing! Can you finish a wall from lattice to plaster in a single day?" Um, if you're if you're happy with the base coat earth and plaster as you're finished, yes. Yeah. That was one thing that I, I found so interesting in the community work and uh, they were decorating even on different levels of the process. They would add decoration. And you said that's kind of a, a Japanese philosophy of plastering that even if you stopped here, it would be OK. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't know if those were decorations, but the the belief is that every step should be beautiful. Um, the homeowner should be able to enjoy every step of, of the, of the way, every, every part of the build. Um, and so, you know, from our base coat plasters to our, our, our bamboo lattice base coats, the brown coats, the finishes, you, you want every step to be beautiful. That was such a nice idea. I'd never heard that before. And uh, it makes so much sense, right? Especially mm -hmm. in, uh, natural disaster prone Japan, right? If you, you have the community helping to do a really big area and you get one base coat done, why not design it? Because it might be your last chance. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll see a lot of earthen storehouses in Japan that um, are left with the base coat, right? They, they, they don't have the lime plastered finish on it. They're quite beautiful. Yeah. I really, I love that philosophy. Uh, Lockdown Tourist says, I love the philosophy. Every step is beautiful. Yeah, me too. Great, great idea. Um, is there anything we haven't touched on yet? We've got 15 more minutes. 
I don't want to miss out on any major plastering insight. One one of one of the comments or questions that you had earlier was about the the plastering school in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the ano, Kyoto Fu Sakan Gino Senshu Gakuin uh, is the name of the the plastering school. <laughs> is there uh, a, a link that we could put below? That sounds um, like a math, I mouthful. I don't I don't have a link, but um, if you call, if they get in touch with Kyoto Fu. Um, they can get you in touch with the plastering school. They, uh, as far as I, as far as I know, there's they still run a two-year course in plastering. They used to do a six-month course too. Oh wow! No, a two-year course. Six months or two years? That's right. Wow. Um, another interesting story. Oh, thanks for that. That's really useful. Another interesting story, you were talking about the house that you remodeled and did plastering in Fukushima a year before the disaster. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was a, a straw bale wall. And the earth that we used in that build was from a 150-year-old farmhouse. We took the earth, remixed it, added some more straw fiber to it, and, and used that, that earth to plaster the straw bale wall. And there was no cracking in that straw bale wall. Um, in Iwate village, uh, had a a, a shindo it had a, um, a shindo. That's the scale of earthquakes in Japan. It had a it's a scale from one to seven, and um, Itate village had a shindo six on that seven point scale. So a very very powerful earthquake. The earthen oven that I was a part of of building in front of the building. Uh, collapsed, was destroyed. Um, but the, yeah, the the straw bale wall. There was no cracking in the straw bale wall. That was really interesting to me, and this came up on your website and in your lecture a few times about the plastering being flexible and allowing give, which is better for natural disasters like earthquakes or storms. Yeah, I think may maybe John um, talked about this during his lecture, but uh, in traditional Japanese timber frames, there's no diagonal bracing. There's no triangle uh, in the structure. And all, all architects or builders know that the triangle is the most stable shape. Um, but there's no use of the triangle in traditional Japanese building, um, which allows for more flexibility in the frame. And what happens in, in during an earthquake, uh, the, the, the frame is allowed to move and the bamboo lattice and the earth and plastered walls absorb the energy from the earthquake. Uh, and oftentimes they will, they'll, they'll crack, but that earth can be remixed and reapplied. Uh, so you kind of, again, a house that was built 30 years ago, if that house had collapsed, it would have become landfill. These traditional Japanese homes can often be fixed. Uh, with the original materials. Yeah, I, I noticed that uh, when we had a big earthquake in our area and there's some concrete buildings around and there's also earth plaster buildings around. And I did see some of the earth plaster buildings had small cracks and the repair people came over and fixed it. <laughs> and then the concrete ones could not be fixed. And yeah. when it's a bad earthquake, that that building has to come down. There is no what, fix. What a wonderful testament to the the appropriateness of Japanese timber frames and earth plastering in Japan. Absolutely, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Wendy says about the straw. When you have straw bale houses, is it rice straw? How is it baled? I'm familiar with the U.S. wheat straw bales and balers haven't seen that here in japan yeah japan doesn't have a very strong livestock culture so there are a few baling machines these are these are machines that are attached to a tractor uh the there's a, a shaft on the tractor called the pto that rotates and that that's what drives the baler to um oftentimes the bales that we work with in japan are rice straw but sometimes they're wheat straw from from toyama prefecture yeah Interesting. Um, she also said, "Are do you have any concerns with human-produced chemicals in the earth when you're using earth as part of the plaster?" Um, 
like it was contaminated or chemicals in the straw or the earth. I, I uh -huh. noticed in the, when you were talking about getting the clay, I think it was for the temple, the Zen Yoji temple, um, you said they wanted it from Gifu and Aishi because they, they were worried about radiation in the soil. So yeah. that, that is a concern sometimes, huh? Yeah, I think for some people living in, um, in Tokyo, maybe northeast Japan, it's a concern. You know, worried about the radiation levels of the, of the timbers or earth that might be used in a build. Um, I haven't been particularly worried about chemicals in the straw or the earth. Yeah, I, I know in, um, when I went to Bizen, which is in Okayama, where you are, um, they're famous for their yakimono, their pottery. Yeah. And yeah. they are so proud of their pure clay that they use. That's awesome. Right? For making mm -hmm. the pottery. So maybe, hopefully, the Okayama area has a lot of pure soil. But certainly in, in some areas of Japan, you, you might be concerned with soil purity or something if you're going to put it inside your walls. Right? Yeah, this is um, not 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 directly related, um, kind of indirectly related. But you you mentioned the quality of the soils in Okayama, um, and this kind of gets into a real kind of deep plastering maniac um, topic. But one of the reasons why earth plastering in Kyoto developed to such a high level is because of the great clays that are available in the Kyoto area. Um, there was a famous clay called Juraku. Uh, that has very good water resistance. And that's one of the reasons why you see um, homes finished with earthen plasters in Japan is because of the, um, the high quality clay. And another soil that's famous in, in Kyoto is the, the brown coat earth from Fushimi, Fukaksa is the name of this. And it's, it's not used in finishes, it's used in the brown coats. But the special thing about this clay is you don't need to add any sand to it. You just add straw fibers and mix it, and it's just the right mix for a brown coat. In Okayama, we have a similar clay. You don't need to add any sand to it, just add the straw fibers, and you get a very similar brown coat. Um, so yeah, I feel really blessed to have that that great earth um, so close by. Yeah, that's amazing. On, and on our mountain, we also have really good clay soils as well. That's great. Um, and I was surprised at how many different kinds of plaster there are. Um, I'm showing on screen right now, Hikizuri, Mizugone, Noren, Higeko. Do you have a certain one that you always go to, like your favorite, or you'll use anything? Uh, there's, a, there's a huge variety of earth and lime finishes in Japan. Um, and oftentimes the, the different kind of earth, earth and plastered finishes are distinguished by the inclusion of a seaweed glue or not. Also by how large the particles are in the plaster. Um, generally, the finer the particle size, the more difficult to finish. And also fermented. Some are fermented, others are not. Is that right? Yeah, yes, that's right. The, the base coat earth plaster is generally fermented. Uh, and there's a number of advantages to fermenting the base coat. Um, but I think probably the primary advantage is breaking up a single strand of straw into many, many fine plant fibers. Wow, interesting. And something I had no idea about, which I probably should have known about, um, is putting an edge. I, I'm missing the word right now. Chi, chiri mawari. Yeah, yeah, chiri mawari. That's so yeah. interesting. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, well, that it's also a very regional dependent thing. Like in Okayama, oftentimes our walls have um, chiri jakuri, which is a, a groove in the wall that um, provides some of the benefits of the chiri mawari. Um, so we sometimes we don't have to do the chiri mawari. Uh, Sorry, this is all quite, you know, real, real detailed uh, so this is conversation. Basically, chi, chi, uh, if I understand it right, it's yeah. basically a kind of, it looks like a screen. 
and it it helps uh, cover the edge of the plaster so that it would be completely sealed. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, the 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 main purpose of the chirimari is to prevent a gap from opening between the earthen plaster and the timber frame. That's the main purpose. The the second main reason for doing the chirimari coat is to get a perfect reveal of the wood. Um, so if you had a a Japanese style room where you have the earthen plastered wall built between posts, um, let's say every uh, 91 centimeters or every um, 182 centimeters, you might have a, a post. Doing the Chirimari helps you get a consistent reveal in, in every wall in that room. That's amazing. I, I mean, one complaint I did get from my family when I plastered was that I didn't clean the edges well enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there this looks like another kind of time-consuming thing, but I could imagine it makes it look really beautiful when it's done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, you pointed out something really interesting. Um, when we look at a wall... Uh, what we oftentimes notice is where dissimilar materials meet. I think that's that's naturally a detail that that we pick up on. And if that line between different materials is beautiful, uh, the wall looks beautiful, um, even if let's say the plastering isn't that great. That, right? It's really where that where the dissimilar materials meet that that kind of a, draws the eye. That is so true, especially where the plaster uh, leaves the beams exposed. You definitely yeah. want to have that clean edge where the material is different. That's a very good point. I should um, clean my edges better. <laughs> um, oh, we've got only a few more minutes. I've got so much more to talk about. You, you have such a depth of knowledge. I can't even imagine even tapping into everything that you know. But these are the things that stood out to me is so interesting. Nice. Um, yeah, John, who was in our talk this morning, he took part yeah. in a plastering class and he paid you such a nice compliment. He said that he enjoyed plastering so much, but he has decided it's better for him to focus on carpentry and architecture and to leave plastering to somebody else who just wants to focus on plastering. Because yeah. he yeah. realized the depth of skill and technique that you need to develop over time. Is that, is that mm -hmm. true? Do you find that for plastering that you really need to do it for a long time to really get the right techniques? And Oh, yeah. If, if it was something that you could pick up in a day, there would be no need for craftsmen. Right? These are, these are all very specialized skills um, that we've put in hundreds, you know, maybe thousands of hours uh, into, into, into developing, you know. And one thing that's really beautiful about uh, the world that John is in, in carpentry and also the world of plastering, is that there's no, um, there's no end to the improvements that can be made in your field, right? There's like unlimited growth, the opportunity for unlimited growth. And I think that uh, that challenge uh, is just really kind of inspiring and um, addictive for a lot of craftspeople. Yeah. Well, one of the questions I asked him was what part of his trade does he really enjoy? So what part of your trade, plastering, what is the aspect that you really enjoy? Oh, um, plastering is beautiful. And I, I think there's I realized really early that there were three things that I loved about plastering. One was that um, it was physical. Um, it was like athletic. It's almost, you know, like a sport, plastering. Um, I liked that it was practical. It was actually doing something to, to help somebody. And then I also liked that it had this aesthetic quality to it. I mean, there, there is a, a sense of beauty uh, in, in doing it well. And you know, that, that sense of doing it well and the sense of beauty, there's no limit to that in, in, in the improvements that can be made. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. 
Um, so we talked about your workshop and I've shown your website and I will add links below. Um, that okay. That is our hour. That was wonderful. Okay, Thank great. you so much. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, I'd love to have you back awesome. again and talk about a different part of plastering because there's so much more that we could not cover. Um, but if you're interested in plastering, definitely uh, get in touch with Kyle and uh, have a look at his yeah. website and we'll look forward to more videos, explanation videos, or maybe a few clips from your workshops as they come up. Awesome. That'd be wonderful. Awesome. Uh, okay. Last comment, V says, very interesting. Thanks, V. And Lockdown Tours says, I love the way Kyle talks about plastering. You can really feel his passion. Very nice. Mm. Thank thanks. you. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great chat. Thank you. Thanks all for joining. Have a great night. And uh, we have another talk tomorrow night, 5 p.m. Hiko Simon and I will be talking about what the sustainable news Japan <laughs> mm. Our second episode. Um, Lockdown Tourist says, I'm now very interested in plastering. That's awesome. Cool. <laughs> we need more plastering fanatics, right, Kyle? Yeah, yep. It'd be great if everybody gets into it, I think. Mm. Something we should ask our remodel companies more about and try ourselves as well. It's very enjoyable. Even as a total novice, I would recommend trying. So. Mm. Yeah. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks, everybody. Great. Have a good night.